Shalom and welcome to the Heartland Connection. This is Zach Waller, the Executive Director of Hayovel, your host, coming to you guys straight from the Heartland of Israel. Wow, it's been a really incredible week. I've had uh, Yom Kippur, uh, just a really, really um, amazing time pressing into God and thanking Him for His atonement and uh, just realizing how uh, merciful that God is uh, is this truly amazing thing. And going back to Rosh Hashanah, of recognizing Him as our King, and that fear that comes along with that, that holy fear, but also as a loving Father who wants to have mercy and bless and equip and uh, undergird and give strong confidence to His children. Uh, so it's such a blessing. Each one of God's feasts are just so... Uh, amazing and how he has them all set up it's like becomes more and more obvious the more (laughs) that I celebrate these or observe these that God Almighty the creator of the universe like put these together just perfectly for us humans so that we can process through things and experience the things we need to experience in order for our life to be the fullest and uh, it's just so amazing to see harvest is in full swing we are um doing a lot of harvesting um, a lot of grapes are ready and ripe right now and so the boatload of grapes the uh, mountains are dripping with sweet wine the uh, the prophetic grapes are coming in full full steam so that's very exciting <clears throat> appreciate your prayers for volunteers a lot of hot days a lot of uh, hard labor and out there working and everybody's doing great uh, but we've got a lot of grapes to pick so we appreciate y'all's prayers as we press on in serving the farmers here in the heartland. And we've got Sukkot right around the corner. Uh, Sukkot is like such an amazing holiday uh, feast. <clears throat> uh, I love the Deuteronomy 16 where the uh, commandment's given to keep the feast and it says uh, in verse 13, you shall keep the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days And when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your wine press, you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall keep the feast of the Lord your God at the place that the Lord will choose, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful. So... Here we were commanded to be joyful. We're commanded to rejoice. You shall rejoice in your feast. And uh, it's interesting that the agriculture is so um, stated in here too, that the produce, once you've gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your wine press, specifically speaking of grapes, once you've gathered in your uh, harvest, then you shall go up to the feast and rejoice uh, before God. And then uh, down in verse 15 also, um, you're rejoicing because God has blessed you in all the produce um, and the work of your hands. So it, it's such an incredible thing that God would uh, create the world and us in this um, just immense joy that we can participate in, that we can have here. I think it's, uh, it's definitely something I've learned a lot from the Jewish people here in Israel about how um, God didn't create this world as a place of just suffering and just pain and all these things, but he actually created it where it would be a place where we could um, have joy and peace and all these things that we're supposed to be bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. And so all these things can be had right here uh, on the earth. I think it's a, it's a common Christian understanding that we're trying to escape the earth and get up to heaven somewhere up in the clouds, but uh, I think it's a more accurate thing and something that the, the Jewish people definitely have a concept of is that we're no, we're actually wanting to bring heaven here, right here in the natural, in the everyday things. We want God to be here. And Sukkot is definitely a time where God, like this is a picture of God tabernacling among us, God coming and being with us. <clears throat> and uh, we look forward to the day when the Messiah comes and tabernacles with us as well. Uh, just a little fun thing. If you guys Google 
Reverb Nation, Cradle Warrior, in the Suka. Then you will find a song that uh, I put together a long time ago. But it's a fun song about Sukkot, and I think you guys would be blessed by it. So if you Google Reverb Nation, Cradle Warrior, and the song is called In the Suka, then uh, you might have some fun with that. I encourage you to look it up and and uh, share it with everybody you know so they can enjoy and have fun. And maybe it'll be a little uh, inspiration for you to really get in and rejoice and have joy during this Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> I also wanted to mention that uh, we're doing something really different this year. We had never really done marathon races or running or anything like that before, but this year, um, <clears throat> a couple of our guys found out about it. <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, started training. And uh, this has really turned into a really amazing thing. We actually have forty of our Highville staff members training to run in this marathon. <clears throat> during the Feast of the Tabernacles, and it's happening in the heartland of Israel, right here in Samaria. And uh, Josh and Caleb came up with a really creative idea. Um, they decided that they're going to carry a pole in between them, just like the Josh and Caleb in the Bible, with a cluster of grapes. Um, and uh, so we've we've also decided to help uh, to, to make a way for the nations to join us in this too. So basically, we've put together this thing where every person from outside, from from anywhere in the world that wants to be a part of building up the Heartland, can give a hundred dollars, and it'll add a grape to Joshua and Caleb's cluster. Um, and then they're going to carry this. And what's really awesome is, like. Biblically, this is the time when Israel would take what God has blessed them with, what we just read about in Deuteronomy 16, and they would bring it up to the feast. And so uh, symbolically, Joshua and Caleb are going to be carrying this uh, grape cluster up, and the, the, the marathon actually ends in Shiloh, where the tabernacle stood for 369 years. So the children of Israel would have come up right to that spot back in the day. And so, and that grape, grape cluster is going to uh, symbolize uh, gifts that have been given from all the nations going up to uh, Shiloh during the Feast of Tabernacles to the Tabernacle. And so it's just really, really awesome. We're really excited and we're really um, grateful that God has provided this way where we can bring more awareness to the heartland of Israel and that we can provide a way for people in the nations to also join us in this bringing awareness and building up the heartland. So if you've been best blessed by these podcasts or or the other things that uh, that we're doing here at Hayuvel, then I would encourage you to consider making a donation that way and to, to keep these things going to be a part of what's happening here in the heartland of Israel. We really appreciate that. So this week's Torah portion is Ha'azinu, which means give ear, or listen. And we're in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Um, as I was reading through this, um, I really, I don't know, even the last couple portions, it's, it's hit me every time going through. It's like, wow. The children of Israel are just about to go into the promised land. They've, they've. It, it, it seems like a climax. It seems like they're, they're about to arrive. That uh, you know, God told Abraham, "Get out of your father's house to a land that I will show you, and through you all the families of the earth will be blessed." And so Abraham immediately goes into Israel. And so the children of Israel, when they're in Egypt, they know they have to get back to the promised land. And here, it appears that they're like right on the brink of success that they're right on the brink of the uh, redemption like this this point because they they have the nation this this uh, kingdom this kingdom of God that's that God is building and forging and they're right on the edge of going into the land it seems like this this could be it this could be like the final thing but over the last couple portions we've read over and over again that there was going to be a time of Israel separating from God. Um, and it's really kind of hard to understand. Like, I'm thinking, wow, if I'm Joshua and Moses is telling me, all right, buddy, you're going to be the next leader and you're going to take the people into the promised land, be strong and courageous, go into the land. Um, you know, that would make sense. But then he goes on to say, oh, and by the way, the people are all going to be taken off into exile, there's going to be, you know, you're going to turn away from God, it's going to be idol worship, there's going to be all kinds of awful, horrific things that are going to happen, and it's going to be really bad. If I was Joshua, I'd be like, what in the world am I doing, and why would I want to do this if ultimately it's not going to be successful, we're going to go off into exile? 
why does there have to be all this suffering and pain and all these things? And as Moshe here in this week's portion is singing this song and like telling them to teach this song to the children of Israel and like it's supposed to be something that they're supposed to sing and, and even in uh, you know, Revelation we hear about the song of Moses and there's a couple different ideas about what that could be but one of the ideas is it's this song right here. Um, and it's just like, wow, you know, wh- okay, what is going on here? Why do we have this... Uh, seems like a need to have pain and suffering. Why do we? Why are we prophesying this? Why are we speaking this into existence and telling Joshua this right before they go into uh, the land of Israel? So I want to tell a little story. Something that happened to me recently. It was about a week before Yom Teruah, re- week before Rosh Hashanah, and uh, Beck and I went to Rami Levy. Now the Rami Levy is basically like the Walmart of Israel. Um, there's not really any equivalent to Walmart here. Um, they still uh, have a lot of you know the smaller shops and stuff, and uh, which I think is probably a good thing, but uh, that's a whole other deal. Um, but Rami Levy is like the, the big grocery store, and so it was a week before Rosh Hashanah. And I thought, oh, you know, we'll be able to run in real quick and grab some stuff. You know, we're not that close to the feast yet, where it'll just be packed out with people. And it was around lunchtime too. It was like twelve, one o'clock, and so I thought, yeah, you know, it probably won't be too bad. Let's be able to run in there and grab stuff. So we walk in the store, and like, boom, there was like tons and hundreds and hundreds, maybe a thousand, I don't know, people in there, <coughs> loaded, just piled high, shopping carts, and uh, it was crazy. And we're like, oh my goodness. So we run around the store, we're like grabbing all of our stuff, trying to get in line quick before another one of those, you know, huge carts gets pulled, pushed up. And uh, so we're hurrying around, grabbing all of our stuff. And uh, so we get in one of the lines, and then, you know, we're just sitting there and sitting there and waiting and waiting and waiting. And then one of the other lines gets a little shorter, so we jump over to that line, and, uh, you know, we're playing this little game. And then uh, so finally we get, uh, we end up behind this lady who has a cart that I'm telling you is, like, piled so high you, you wouldn't believe. Uh, so high that when she gets up to the cash register finally, she starts putting her stuff over onto the counter, and the guy starts checking, you know, go, uh, scanning all the stuff and checking her out. And uh, it, there's so much stuff in the cart that she, the guy has uh, scanned enough stuff to where it's a huge pile on the other end of the cash register, on the other end of the counter. And she's got a huge pile on the counter that hasn't been scanned, and there's still like half a cart left in her cart, like half a cart full of groceries still left. And uh, so she's trying to figure out what to do, and she's taking her groceries out, putting them on the floor, and trying to pile up more stuff different places. And then all of a sudden, a peanut butter jar falls off of the counter, crash, bangs on the floor, and peanut butter and oil and all that messy stuff everywhere. And one of the employees comes over, and he's trying to help, and he goes, and he tries to go back to the back and try to find another one to match it so he can help this lady out. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of watching but no not not trying to stare too much and know what's going on here and uh, but i'm just thinking kind of subconsciously almost in the back of my mind wow this lady's probably about had it like she's i mean if i was in this situation i mean she's just trying to check out and she's been waiting this line for who knows how long and then she's having all this trouble with all the groceries she's trying to get and then the peanut butter falls off and it's just it just seems like a super frustrating scenario and uh so then i just look up and glance at her and she's got this big old smile on her face and i'm like huh you know i think if this was happening in the states this lady would be like irate she'd be like just grabbing a few groceries and just walking out the door or you know like um at least a countenance that you could tell she was super frustrated at least right and uh and then the guy that's checking her out you know it's it's he's trying to figure this whole thing out too he's just like belly laughing like just this big roar just laughing and i couldn't quite catch what the conversation was or what what the joke was or what he was exactly was laughing about but the the, but the point is i guess is that he wasn't super frustrated even though there was very frustrating frustrating things happening and so as i'm trying to process okay what is the deal with this lady's smile on her face and i realized that she was getting all these groceries in order to make Rosh Hashanah, the feast day, Yom Teruah, a special day. And I, and I imagine, especially looking at the pile of stuff she had, that she had big plans. Like she was probably going to invite her family and her friends, and um, you know, who knows who all was going to come and be a part of this. 
And I just realized, wow, she is so excited about what's coming. She's so excited about um, the feast that's coming and celebrating that even though this situation she's in right now could be frustrating, she actually has a smile on her face because she believes that it's worth it, that it's worth it to go through all this trouble, whatever it is, for that feast to be the most amazing thing uh, ever. She could have just got a few things, right? She could have made it simple. She could have gotten less. She could have just, uh, you know, gone with that jug of peanut butter and brought it to her house and just, you know, and, uh, you know, my family's really into peanut butter, so maybe that wouldn't be a terrible thing for my family. But uh, but she had a huge pile with meat and chocolates and candies and all these things. And, uh, and you could tell she was into this. This was like something she was going to do and do well. And I just realized, wow, this thing that could have been very frustrating was a joy because she recognized what was coming and that what she was going through right now was worth what she knew was going to come later, that she wanted to be a part of, that she wanted to really focus in on now for what was coming. And I realized, huh, you know, this is something that seems to be the way God has made these things that that for some reason there's there in a lot of different areas there's this this struggle or this um, this place of of um, difficulty that if we hang on and stay in there leads to a place of great victory and celebration you know we could relate this to uh, purity for instance right so um, if we're able to hold on and fight the battle for purity, even in uh, a world that, that pushes all kinds of impure things, um, if we're able to hold on and fight this battle and stay steady, and hold on, and stay, stay firm, uh, then the reward is huge, uh, is incredible. Having a, uh, a marriage where without all the baggage, have, raising a family where there's not you know, these things. That, you know, I mean, the, unfortunately the horrific statistics are in um, a lot of broken families in this world today and a lot of horrific things happening. And um, I think a lot of that's just because people don't know how. They don't know what to do. But if we're able to educate people, we're able to know what to do. If we're able to know which groceries we need for the party, then the party is going to be amazing, right? If we're able to figure out and seek God and find him on these things, then he will reveal himself to us. He will show us how to go. Now, so that's just one example. But obviously, just overall, in our pursuit of God, um, sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's it's difficult. It's really hard. Um, but if we push through, if we're able to hang in there, then the result, then the, the prize, right? We're pressing toward the goal for the prize. Running is, it can be difficult. We're pressing toward the goal for the prize and it's worth it. And if we recognize what the goal is and that the goal is worth it, then the loading the groceries onto the counter becomes... A lot less frustrating. Maybe not even frustrating at all. Maybe we could even smile about it. Maybe we could even laugh about it. Maybe we could even, um, you know, be able to get through it uh, with joy. And as I was thinking about this concept, I, I thought about uh, Hebrews chapter twelve in verse twelve, and it's talking of Yeshua, and it says that He is the the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And I thought, wow, this is like the ultimate story of having to struggle, having to go through something, but seeing that the end result was something that was worth it. And I, I just like, wow, like even Yeshua, he he knew this thing. He knew the struggle. He knew um, this, this shame, but he didn't despise the shame. He didn't say, oh, the shame, the shame that I'm going to feel is not worth it or the shame that it's going to be I'm going to be looked at how I'm going to be looked at, wherever it's, but no, it's worth it. It's worth this effort that it's going to take because I know the goal. I know the prize, and I was just so blessed and encouraged by that. And as I was reading through some of the Psalms, too, recently, and uh, my brother Braden has put a lot of Psalms to music, and as they were singing through Psalm 118, um, there was a verse, uh, I think it's around 13 or 14, something like that. It says, um, I, I was pushed hard. I was, I was just really pushed hard so that I was falling. Like it's almost 
gone. It's almost like helpless. Like I was pushed and I was falling. It says, but the Lord helped me. And then in verse 18, it says, uh, the Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. And I just thought, wow, even King David knows this thing too. It's like he has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. And I just thought, wow, this is so powerful that, um, and in this concept, I think if if we are able to recognize it, that in this world we will have tribulation, right? We will have difficulties, but we need to be of good cheer because Yeshua has overcome the world. Um, if we can hang in there. And I think a huge part of being able to hang in there is recognizing the goal, recognizing what we're headed towards. And so I was really inspired to you know, seek God's kingdom even harder, even more fervently so that I know what the goal is so that when those struggles come up, I'm just like, ah, you know, I don't know if this is worth it. Because, right, if we don't know what the goal is, when the struggle comes, we're like, you know what, I don't know. I don't I don't know if there really is a prize worth attaining. I don't, I'm not sure uh, if this is really worth it with the purity thing. And I don't really know, you know, what it would be like or if it really even makes a difference. Uh, so I don't even know if it's worth it because it's hard. So I'm going to give in because, you know, I don't know. I don't really know if this is all worth it. So we need to understand what we're headed towards, what the kingdom of God is, what we're building, what we're trying to get to um, so that when we're putting the groceries on the counter, we can have a smile on our face knowing that there's going to be a big feast coming. And I know, you know, going through the last, you know, the 10 days of all up until Yom Kippur, in many ways, I felt, you know, severely chastened, right? Like King David said, it was chastened severely. <clears throat> In many ways, I, I felt that. and um, But just realized that I know uh, God is using all these things to grow me and to glorify himself. And, you know, it's, it's that time of year to, to, to shake things up a little bit. You know, the shofar blast, there's a different, the different sounds, right? You have tekiah. Uh, which is with like the the longer solid blast, and you have terua, which is like the the broken blast. And uh, you know we need times in our life that we're solid, that we're consistent. But then this time of year, you know, the ten days of awe leading up to Yom Kippur is is the time where we need to break it up a little bit. We need to look at ourselves to have some time for introspection and be like, okay, God, take me and mold me. Even though that might be a little hard, it might feel a little rough getting molded. Please mold me into what you want me to be because I want to be ready for the feast. I want to uh, be able to uh, uh, be a representative for you in this world. So I just want to encourage all of you guys too. If you're going through a hard time right now, hold on. Don't give up. God is there. Um, And I was thinking, you know, when somebody writes a song or a poem or an article or something like that, when they write from their experiences, it's what resonates the most, right? It's what's the most encouraging, the most edifying. And most of the times those things are out of a struggle, right? There's a struggle and then there's a victory. And um, those are the things that are most powerful because we relate to that. There's something about the struggle that uh, enables us to hear God somehow more clearly or in a way that we haven't before or something like that. It like it somehow it, 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 it uh, softens our heart somehow so that we can... Uh, walk in a, in a clear path and uh, find that place of victory. And I think in a way too, it helps define what the goal is. You know, when we're going through the struggle, then we start questioning, wait, what am I doing this for? And then the goal gets more defined even in those places too, and then the most in those places. I, uh, I, I love Psalm 37 as well. It says in verse uh, 23, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong. For the Lord upholds his hand. And he says, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. So I'm really encouraged knowing that uh, all these groceries that I'm loading up at the cashier counter will be used in the soon coming feast. And uh, yes, I, I think that we could refer that to Sukkot, but also the great wedding feast that we're all waiting for. Thanks so much for listening. Shabbat Shalom from the beautiful, exceedingly good land of Israel. Restoration.